Well, Kishori, it's so nice to meet you in person, or I guess virtually in person. Same here. <laughs> yeah. So you are a producer. I know that. And, um, but you've worked in food. You did Eater's um, Guide to America. Was that what it was called? Uh, Eater's Guide to the World. Yeah. To the World. Oh, sorry. Not to be, uh, you know, what's the word about like thinking America is the most important, not that, but the world. <laughs> so are you, maybe you're a producer, but are you, is, has food always been like a big thing for you? Food has always been a big thing for me. Um, I grew up with a uh, very food oriented house. My mother's a really amazing cook. I would argue the best home cook I've ever met. I think a lot of people say that maybe about their parents. <laughs> I've been reading your blog long enough to know that that's not how you, <laughs> that you did not grow up in a very uh, mom cooking household. Ah, right? you've done your research on your I'm therapist, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny because um, I feel like my guests, now that I've done this for a while, I think you're like my 20th or 30th, I don't even know how many I've done, but like, it feels like people who are really into food either have one of two backgrounds, either they grew up in a home where there was no cooking and they wanted to create that for themselves, or they grew up in a home where there was amazing cooking and they yeah. kind of wanted to carry on that tradition. So yeah. I'm in the latter camp. Um, and, uh, you know, um, don't think I'll ever be at her level in my opinion, but, um, it's where I just grew up with, uh, watching her throw dinner parties and watch her, uh, obviously benefit just from eating her cooking all my life um but also just it was always a sign of caretaking for her um mm -hmm. there was a friend who was who needed help or she uh, it's definitely a love language for her is, is to cook for others and uh I think uh that I would say that's fairly true of me as well I definitely love to cook for others more than myself I'd probably say oh, wow. <laughs> no, that's so interesting because I'm home alone now because Craig, my partner, is in New York uh, directing an episode of Gossip Girl, which yeah. is really fun. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not cooking as much, and I think it's for that very reason. I think it's like, okay, like what, what, what's the point of like getting everything out and making up this huge mess? I'm like, I don't need this for me. I just want somebody else to tell me how good it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe my other love language is like words of affirmation because I want the like wait but how does it taste how does it taste how do you like it oh um, yeah that's a very common thing in my guests too is people pleasing yes yes I think I have a definitely have that that streak um but yeah my mom is a really great cook and so um I definitely picked up uh that from her although she um I hope she doesn't mind me saying this <laughs> <laughs> she I feel like didn't want to so I have two sisters so it was okay. a very female heavy household and I think my mom wanted to make sure that there was never a gendered expectation mm -hmm. for us to cook so she kind of avoided teaching us actually mm. almost on purpose I would say so it wasn't until I left home for college and I and you know needed to start learning how to cook for survival reasons that's when I, I was like bugging her to like wait how did you do this how did you do this how do you do this um, and we have this sort of running joke between the two of us that she like doesn't always give me the full recipe completely. So mm -hmm. always like, <laughs> I'm like, you're withholding some of the magic a little bit. That's so common. I've heard that so much from people whose mothers cook where it's like, they don't, they never quite <laughs> are able to figure it out. And I actually have a friend, uh, Shereen, I might've talked about this on the podcast, but she's Pakistani and, uh, she invited me to her family home to learn her mother's recipes because she herself couldn't figure them out. So she's like, come with me. And it was exactly the same thing for me. Like I was watching her, this, her mother cook these, this incredible food, but she right. was like, you know, sizzling like cumin seeds and like oil and like dumping it into potatoes. And it was all happening so fast. I was like, wait, what are you doing? Like, what is that? And like sprinkling spices. So yeah, I, I've experienced that too. Yeah. And in fairness, because she, she, my mom was always like, I'm trying, I am earnestly trying not to withhold this from you, but she, in fairness to her, uh, which is, I don't think specific to Indian culture or South Asian culture, but so many of the recipes just weren't written down. And it was so much based on observation and metrics, like a palm full of something instead of like the idea of like, like I remember just having my buggy, my mom so much. She's like, Oh, I guess that's technically, you know, half a teaspoon, but she's mm -hmm. like, she's not, she's not using measuring spoons when she's 
doing it. Happen. I'm reading a book right now called Miriam's Kitchen. It's about a Holocaust survivor and her daughter-in-law, like learning to cook from her. And some of the recipes are like in coffee mugs. Like it says like, you know, to make her recipe for, I think, Mandelbrot, which is like a Jewish biscotti. It was sort of like, use a coffee mug of sugar and a coffee mug of, of right. flour. It's like, what? Right. But that's yeah. kind of crazy. Wait, so where did you grow up? So I, um, I was born in Canada, but moved to the U.S. when I was like one years old. So um, have been in the U.S. pretty much my whole life um, and grew up in this, in a town called Niskayuna, New York, which is a, a suburb of um, Schenectady near Albany. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm in New York City. Uh, I've been in New York City for a good minute. Uh, since Got it. Yeah. Well, I got distracted just now because I'm looking at your books on the shelf oh. behind you. And I feel like this is another podcast, but how people organize their books, but I'm noticing they're organized by color. And they I'm are. curious, I'm curious about that. Yeah, I, uh, it's funny. I, people, um, I read a lot and um, I genuinely remember books by their covers, but I do know there's a lot of like, uh, bibliophile types who, who sort of scorn at the mm. color organizing and I know there's like it's been accused of being like a basic organizing. <laughs> you seem basic. very self-conscious about this yeah. but you know I, I I stand by it I I can remember I know where every book in my house is I've, I have a few more bookshelves and than this one and um I uh I genuinely remember the color of the spine of a book more than anything else so um, really I, I, yeah I, I I it's not just for the aesthetic although I do like I do it does please my my aesthetic you have a lot of black books I do um, like, I mean just like the color of the books are black <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know, it's like you have like a little red or a little orange a little very little yellow a lot of white but then a ton of black books <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at my overflow bookshelf I have to say so I, oh I like, okay if you were over I'd show you my better the better color blocked bookshelves which is not this one <laughs> Do you collect uh, cookbooks too, or do you have a lot of cookbooks? I do have a lot of cookbooks. Um, I have a separate shelf by my kitchen. Um, do you have any, fa any favorites though, like as someone who oh, loves books? Yes. Um, besides mine, of course, but you besides know. yours, uh, you know, there's a book that I don't feel like in a, I don't get, I don't think it gets enough credit um, as being very good is it's called, uh, now I'm forgetting, but I, <laughs> I'll know. Yeah. Just tell me a little bit about it. I'll tell you what it's, it is. It's, um, I'm Googling this really quickly because wow. it's not in front of me. I, I've used it so much, but I'm, it's Masala. It's a book. It's an, it's an Indian cookbook. It leans is, it's an Indian American cookbook, um, which I feel like is now a very trendy sort of uh -huh. category to try to, of making like ethnic food for American kitchens. But this is one of the earlier ones. Hmm. And it actually is, um, has some really good recipes uh yeah, now you have to find it because i've never i haven't i don't have this book oh gosh i'm <clears throat> embarrassing myself american, <laughs> american masala maybe okay um sorry give me one <laughs> no this is a good insight into your character we're seeing that you're thorough that yeah. research is important <laughs> to you oh my that... god thank god i said it correctly it's <laughs> <laughs> um american uh masala by suvir saran oh um, yeah suvir saran follows me on instagram well, I am a fan of his and he, um, he, I don't know fully his background, but I believe he's American raised. Uh, he was on Top Chef Masters. Okay. I actually know nothing about him. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Yeah. He's I feel really... like I started on this path that I don't know where I'm ending No, up. he's um, an openly gay Indian man who's married to his husband and like lives like on a farm and like uh, was a chef and is on Top Chef. He's really cool. Amazing. Well, I don't know. I feel like I don't hear people talking about this book I feel like I hear people talking way more about other uh mm -hmm. you know South Asian cookbooks catered to American audiences well I just got Indianish by Priya Krishna. yep yeah. know that one well um but mm. I feel like his was his is, his is really good and um has to me like the perfect instruction for like a yellow doll it has like the perfect instruction for like some of the really basic stuff that you can really use over and over again and um and it really caters to like American supermarkets. So I, I would recommend that. Um, yeah, that's great. <laughs> no, it's funny because like after every podcast, somehow like something comes up where like when I end the podcast, I go immediately online and like buy something. So now I know what I'm going to buy after this is over. So that American, actually is great. He, al he also has 
uh, non-Indian recipes. So it's like, it's truly his, it's truly both. Um, I need to invite him on this podcast and we'll talk about you. <laughs> and you'll be like, who is that? Yeah, it came out in 2007. So okay, um, it's been around. It's been, I just feel like it's, um, I feel like I, I started using it. I remember using it for the first time when I was like, just out of, you know, or like, or it was came out before I was done with college, but like right when I was starting to really cook for myself, I, re- I remember leaning on that because he did have the sort of exact, like, no, like my mom's like a, a palm full of cumin seeds. And he's like, yes, that is half a teaspoon. Like, you know, he, it was right. sort of he translates first. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually I feel like my, the way I make, the way I think of making a basic doll was very much instructed by his instructions. So, you know, I've never made, I've never made doll, but I got into some hot water on my Instagram because I made a um, lentil soup. Uh, I was following, like, I was basically just making a lentil soup that I've made before. That's just called lentil soup. But then I added like coconut milk and I added like turmeric. Like, I added some Indian spices and people in the comments were like, that's doll. Like you need to say that that's doll. <laughs> But I was like, but I was lentil soup with coconut milk, but it was really interesting. Like I, I definitely I like, I, I don't know if I feel like you have to call that doll. I, I, I don't know where I stand on that. I think. Yeah. I got, I got messages from people. I mean, I, I was very open to it. And so I was like, sure. But, um, <laughs> but it, it's fascinating. I've never actually followed a recipe for a doll though. So I need to do that. That's okay. Well, as I've now said a few times, the <laughs> yellow doll recipe in his American book. Masala maker is a very good uh easy basic doll that i think is pretty foolproof um, all right well we've waited long enough now to get into your psychology so i mean we've learned a lot already with the book organization <laughs> and the researching um but kashori what did you have for lunch today so my lunch was a little chaotic <laughs> great i was um eating a few different things so i had what is a pretty standard lunch for me, which is um, a, a very sort of easy comfort food Indian dish um, called upma, um, which is spelled U-P-M-A. And it's like, the best way I can describe it is um, it's like Indian cream of wheat, but it's made of semolina and it's um, savory. So like there's uh, mustard seeds and um, often like green peas, peanuts, um, chilies, uh, yeah, like just sort of different sort of things. And, and it's in, it's in the semolina base and it's very easy. I, I actually, ha- I used a mix, which is like, makes it even incredibly, it's like my version of like box mac and cheese, essentially it's, <laughs> it's truly easy. Um, and yeah, it's just very comforting. It's, it's like a, something I definitely grew up with and, I ate that with uh, Indian pickle, which I have a lot of in my fridge um, and I have a lot of opinions of what I like in that realm. And then I ate a lot of um, fruit because it's very hot here and I had some watermelon. And then I ate, <laughs> some, <laughs> then I ate some gummy candy. Uh, <laughs> someone I work with, she I have a black cat and uh, that I have like, uh, more affection for than is probably necessary. And, uh, someone I work with very kindly sent me black cat gummy candy, <laughs> that I, uh, which is very sweet. And I've been avoiding eating it because it was, it's just, I like just to have this bag of candy as like a thoughtful gift from someone, but I actually opened it today and then I was, they're good, they're good gummy candies. So, um, yeah, that was, I guess. Okay. There's a lot to unpack here. Oh my goodness. I know, wow. I know. I know. This is now, a... do, you, do you consider the gummy candy as being a part of your lunch or was it a post lunch treat? I, w- I feel like I was just in a grazing mode this afternoon. Yeah. I was trying to get some errands done and just, just sort of do life, address life issue stuff, uh, errands that I've been putting off and yeah, it was an, I was just in a grazing mode. So I would count the gummy candy <laughs> as part of it. Yeah. But the up, upma, is that how you say it? Upma? Yep, yep, yeah. That, yep. That, when you made that, um, did the mix, I'm just curious about like what this looked like. Did it have yeah. the peanuts and the things in the mix or did you add that stuff yourself? I added the frozen pea, green peas and the 
peanuts to it. And then um, actually Priya Krishna talks about this a lot. There's a thing that you said, I call it thudka that you add at the end, but I think she calls it chonk or something. She called it. Oh yeah, yeah. She does call it chonk. That's right. Yeah. And my family call it a thudka, but it's um it's like a final garnish, I guess, but it's it's oil and then you put mustard seeds, or you can put a few different things, but you can it's like a gar final garnish on something that um it's it's very easy, but it's sort of I think kind of a very distinctive part of Indian cooking, but it's like very hot oil mustard seeds, chili, um, it can be a few different things, but then you sort of fry it really fast and then put mm -hmm. it over this. The, the mix itself, it's a semolina and there's spices and salt and it's sort of all sort of seasoned already. Mm -hmm. And then you just essentially add like hot water, but then you can add vegetables and cilantro and peanuts and this chonk or thudka or whatever you call it at the end um, to well, dress it up a bit. Yeah. One thing that's like occurring to me though, as you're talking and I'm thinking about your lunch for some reason is textures because mm -hmm. you have like yeah. the, the creamy upma and then you have the um, gummy candy <laughs> and you had the crunchy pickles and the, <laughs> like, you know, I just like, it feels like like a variety of textures. That's a and very good operation. Yeah. I think that's also, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm talking a lot about Indian food. I, I actually don't even eat Indian food. I would say I eat it a lot, but it's not necessarily the majority of what I eat, but um, it is something I do like very much about Indian cooking um, is that it is like, if you've, ever, if you've ever had chaat, you know, there's like yogurt and there's like, it's a, I feel like Indian food is very attentive to texture in a way that I miss in other cuisines. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good observation. Well, I mean, just your grazing too, it felt like you were like, um seeking different like sensory experiences with each thing too it's like the comforting upma but then like the refreshing fruit and then the like you know like debaucherous chewy candy or you know just like each thing like it gave you something different you know which i, I and I, I for some reason i keep thinking about you being a producer and you sort of like producing your lunch like and i and i always ask this question but i have to ask it which is like how conscious were you about coming on this podcast in terms of like what you ate versus like would you have eaten this anyway you know i feel like so i've i've been reading you and following you for a while. So I was very happy to get this call, but I, I, you know, I, 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 I would say, I will say I was conscious of not trying to change what I normally would do. Great. I love um, that. Yeah. Because I feel like when I, I can tell when, like, I love reading, um, Grub Street Diet mm -hmm. uh, Mag, and I feel like I love it when you can tell they're like not putting on a show for you <laughs> like I, I want to yeah. know what your like pantry eats are like I don't really care yeah. what you went to especially um, when it's somebody who you know doesn't really eat anything and then they're like making a big show of like oh I had three dinners today and like yeah. six lunches it's like no you didn't they're like yeah this is not like normal. probably like I want the slightly like not flattering view and not that I whatever not that I'm eating anything necessarily one way or the other but yeah your lunch sounded delicious I mean yeah. I liked it I mean but it was all like pantry it was all like in the in the house already I will say so so do you work from home normally like are you at home most of the day um right now I mostly am you know obviously if I'm on set I'm on set um but right now um I started working with Tessa Thompson in January mm -hmm. congratulations by the way that's so cool Thank you. She's so she's actually the one who gave me the the black cat gummies. I wanted. I had a feeling. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's it was a very funny gift. But she um she started a production company and I joined her as her partner. And a lot of the work right now for the slate of projects we're building are in what we call development, which I know you're very familiar with this. Oh, yeah. Being married to a filmmaker, um, and so. I started with her January, 2021. So that's um, obviously everything has been Zoom and what, whatnot. Um, so yeah, so a lot of my job right now is like reading and writing and and, and Zoom meetings and so forth, which I can just do from my apartment, which is, which is nice. Um, yeah, and I think, I think I raised that question or I brought, I brought that up because the lunch that you made felt like a lunch you can, uh, take the time to make if you're working from home versus yeah. like, yeah, and yeah. so I, I guess I'm curious though, like in your typical week working from home, do you take the time to make yourself nice lunches every day? Oh man, I wish I, my answer was yes. I want, <laughs> I want to be that person. Honestly, the answer is 
not really. I, um, <laughs> I'm a pretty distracted. I will say working from home has made it made certain bad habits worse in that I am worse at taking an actual break and I'm worse about starting and ending my days at set times mm -hmm. without the, any sort of commute. It's sort of, there's no boundaries really. Right. And, and that, that's really on myself. I, I get sort of zoned in and I kind of forget. Um, but uh, for lunch often, like sometimes it's just like a piece of toast with <laughs> like cheese or like just like like a really fast sandwich or I, I did get like a Nutribullet in quarantine mm -hmm. and I have been doing a lot of like green smoothies, which makes me feel virtuous for the <laughs> drink it. Um, but they're actually pretty helpful. Um, and then a lot of it is like leftovers. Like I just, I feel like I just don't really take the time to like cook in the middle of the day that something about that stresses me out, but I would like to be better. About so that. was this lunch that you had today because it was the weekend and you had more time to treat yourself? <laughs> yeah. It's, weekends, I definitely am better at cooking. Um, yeah, it's because it was, it's a Sunday. So that's why. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're doing this on a Sunday, which is not typical for me, but it's a, it's a different window into my patient psychology. So I'm curious, like, it, because you're a producer, um, if you could talk a little bit about the mind, like what it, what kind of personality it takes to be a producer? Cause I think it's such a unique job. And I mean, I obviously like, as you said, like I'm married to a director, so I've, I've, met tons of producers and I know a lot of them socially and I've worked with some of myself, but, but for you, like, you know, what, what, what are the aspects of your personality that make you a good producer? Oh, wow. Um, great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like, I feel self-conscious describing what I like about a producer without sounding like I'm, uh, no, yeah. don't, don't be self-conscious. This is um, a safe space. Nobody's listening to this, so it's fine. <laughs> I will say I love other producers. Like I, it's like some of my favorite people to be around our producers. I just, I think in general, we tend to be very curious, extroverted people who are used to absorbing a lot of other people's stress. We often do have to be sort of therapy type, therapist type roles, mm -hmm. um, others, off better for better or for worse. Um, but I think real like creative producers are just people who just are very big sponges of information. Um, love movies you know are very artistically driven i think that's the big misconception that producers are like i don't know like money folks who just love to like <laughs> be important which is like not the bulk of most producers i know who, who who or producers who i admire like are big cinephiles and big just filmmake i view i think for me producers are filmmakers mm -hmm. um and so you know like it's funny when i go out to dinner with other producers, it's like before the check has hit the table, like everyone has like figured out the bill and has like <laughs> and has an Uber to the next spot ready for everyone. It's like it's just they're good organizers, obviously. Right. Um, and I think producers in general tend to be pretty thoughtful people because you are your job. So much of it is to cater to so many disparate needs. You know, if it's on a movie, you're dealing with your cast and your crew and your investors and you're just you know all these different um, sort of very different needs you have to sort of find the balance to make something that you believe is is worth making and so uh I think a lot of good producers are pretty good at diplomacy um good under pressure pretty good in a crisis well it's so funny because I'm thinking about your mother and her cooking and how you described <laughs> it about how she like took care of other people and to, and, and it feels like somehow yeah. there's like a connection in my mind to like being at the helm of the stove in the kitchen and sort of like yeah. producing all this food and like taking care of your family and taking care of your daughters and taking care of neighbors yeah. and, stuff. And, and then and then also sort of like what you do and like being on a set and taking care of what's going on and nurturing and making sure the director's not freaking out and you know that there's <laughs> there's a real correlation there in my mind that's an excellent point it's funny because I've often told my mom that she would be a very good producer I think, she, mm -hmm. I think she would actually be very good at it um and she she's a you know she works and has has a career but um yeah I think uh I think that's 
a very wise observation. Oh, wow. You're just too flattering. This is part of your producing. <laughs> You're keeping the podcast host happy. Well, it's funny. It's making me, I mean, Craig has had meltdowns. Like when he did his first feature, which was like over 10 or maybe 15 years ago, when he first met, um, you know, he had, they had raised the money to do this feature. Melissa Leo was in it. And, um, and they were shooting it in the Pacific Northwest. And on day one, there was a fire in the truck. They shot it on film. Oh. And all the, all the film, which was so expensive, was in this truck. And there was a fire on the truck. And uh, it looked like all the film had been ruined. Oh, my God. And so he called me. He's like, it's over. Like, my career is over, you know. And this is it. Like, this is the end of, of, of this movie's not going to happen. And I'm going to come home. To, you know. And then I remember his producer had to talk him off the ledge and just sort of, like, help him see and then it turned out that it was like everything was fine like the film just got you know like soot on it but it actually hadn't been damaged and it was okay but I feel like you must deal with a lot of stuff like that just crises that pop up all the time it's a lot of crises uh I'm glad his film was saved uh that is stressful yeah I find um I do think I'm pretty good in a crisis uh, I tend to get very, <laughs> it's funny, my, like my good friends actually have like noticed this about me where and to the point, I, I didn't even realize I do this, but like when I'm really, really stressed, I get really, really still and my voice gets really low and I actually get mm. like, I, I tend to go very inward instead of very outward with my stress, which is, uh, again, there's positives and negatives to that, but sure. um, it's good for others, you know, it's good for <laughs> it's good. <laughs> It's helpful for others when I do that, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah, filmmaking can feel temporarily very high stakes, um, and I think kind of the constant reminder to all of us is like, it's not actually, it, we're not saving lives, you know, we're making, <laughs> we're making movies and uh, making TV, and it's very much a career of choice, but um, yes, on set, things can feel uh, very intense and high stakes. Um, so I'm curious, like, do you ever cook dinner parties and like do you do things where like it's high stakes in the kitchen for you <laughs> I do love having dinner parties um I'm very happy something I miss one of the things I miss the most from the pandemic was just I miss restaurants a lot but I really miss um having people over and just I have a lot of friends who love to cook also I have mm -hmm. three I have a group of four friends like there's like five of us and we have something called <laughs> supper club and the five of us will just cook a very elaborate meal and like shop together and or we'll shop and like kind of bring we'll like assign the grocery list and there's like one friend who's very good at who's like on drink duty and we just sort of take a leisurely day to like cook a very ambitious menu and drink and just eat it all at the end and it's just my favorite way to spend a day honestly that sounds um, amazing what was the last one that you did do you remember what you guys made oh um we uh what did we make? I'm blanking on what we made the very last time, but once we did like, as an example, we did like a very, um, we tried to be a very, we tried to be like very uh, aggressively authentic on a Thai menu. Mm -hmm. So we like bought, like we went to the, like went to the Thai grocery store and like learned all the tips from the store owner and watch YouTube videos and bought a, a green papaya slicer for the, like we just sort of went all in and, and it was, you know, nature, we turned, like learned, there's so many strong opinions of the type of fish sauce and like mm -hmm. the sweetness of fish sauce for certain things. And I've never even been to Thailand. So it was just, I was really, but I love Thai food. And that was like a fun one um, just to like learn about stuff. Um, yeah, that's really cool. I mean, it's yeah. funny because I love Thai food and I've never cooked it, but it's also like, that frame of reference it's sort of like the research you were doing is sort of what I feel like I would need to do because and it's sort of actually why I haven't made doll because I don't feel like I have enough of a frame of reference to even sure. know am I doing this right am I doing this wrong but that's so cool that I, mean, I guess with a group of people you could all learn it together so yeah and you know yeah I, I would say it's the, a big takeaway from the Thai thing was like and I would say this is true for Indian food too is um uh I, I had done all this like research of like the grocery list of what I thought I needed. And then I went to the grocery store. There's a, there's a really cute and really nice Thai Mark Thai grocery store in lower Manhattan. Um, and I actually just talked to the shop owner. I was like, what do you, what do you, what do you, which, like, which brand of this curry paste do you actually use at home? Mm -hmm. and, and like, when you frame it like that, they get really honest and they're like, 
And I, 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 like I had done all this research that said like this, like you should make your curry paste like this from this brand and blah, 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 like from all these Thai experts and Thai mm-hmm. people online. And the store owner's like, they do not taste different. Like go with this one, go with this cost. Do you use this noodle? Don't like, it, and she's like, this is actually the coconut milk I use. Like she, that was actually a very helpful lesson of like, just ask what, ask what they actually cook with. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Because I feel like if people ask me, Indian food stuff. And, uh, you know, I, 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 at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not an expert. I just sort of use what I'm familiar with at the end of the day. And, um, and I have opinions based on that, but like, I can, if someone asks me, what do you use versus what is your, what is the best? I get tr- more tripped up by the second. Mm, that's question. really interesting. Yeah. Um, and that that's, was helpful. Well, it's, it's funny. Cause it makes me think about like the idea of perfection, but like, what does that even mean? Like the idea of like the perfect version of pad thai, is there right. like, is there a perfect version or is there just somebody's like the one that they make at home? You know, it's sort of like, yeah. It's, it's, like, it, uh, yeah. And thing, and something like dal or even chai or like every, the sort of joke is like, they're not a joke, but like, if you ask most Indian people, it's like every household has a different dal. Like every household has a different yeah. way of making chai. Like every, you know, and it's, it's meant to be, very fluid in terms of, and very individualist. Like it should not feel like there isn't, I really reject to your point, like the um, ultimate way to make anything. Oh yeah, which is what the internet is all about. I mean, I used to, as you know, as, as someone who read, read my blog, I used to like get lots of traffic by being like the best broccoli of yes. your life, the best yes. chili of your life. And, you know, I think I always did that sort of tongue in cheek because it's like, of course, like this isn't necessarily going to be the best broccoli of your life, although it is really good because it's, <laughs> it but, is um, but I think, I think people are so intimidated right now by like Google, if you Google, like how to make a meatloaf and it's like, you know, here's like the 20 part method for making the ultimate meatloaf yeah. and you got to, you know, and it's like, wait, 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 you have to like trust your, like, what do you like? Do you want it to be, you know, umami yeah. forward? Do you want cheese in it? Do you, it's like, you have to trust yourself. A hundred percent. And then I feel, then I get tripped up of like, how much of this is the algorithm of the search? Oh, yeah. yeah, a yeah. lot of it is. I mean, it's so funny now too, because so many people are complaining about having to scroll past food blog essays to get to the recipe, including Mindy Kaling just did that. And there's a huge backlash on, um, on Twitter, but I'm at the point now where as a, as a pioneering first generation food blogger, yeah. I get annoyed when I Google a recipe now because a lot of it is like fluff. Like it's not anymore like a really good essay about whatever. It's just like, oh my God, these people are just writing words to make it look like a food blog essay, but it's not even an essay. I, so I'm, I I, I call myself an OG reader of that period. Like I loved that period of food bloggers like you and Deb and and Wednesday Chef. I used to read all of She's back. She's doing, when Luis is doing her blog again. Yeah. I saw, um, and and orange and like i used to religiously read all of you guys and <laughs> i really miss like you know i i do follow a lot of food people on instagram and the sub stacks and all that stuff but i do really miss that like true essay form that wasn't trying to um be calculating anyway it just was it was, it was just truly like here's what's going on in my life in a meandering way and that led to a to a recipe that connected it all like i i love yeah. I love food writing. I loved like cooking for Mr. Latte, like Amanda. Oh, Hensor. I love that book. That's one of my it's, favorite food books. I, I'm so sad that she never read another one. It's truly one of my favorite food books. Yeah. And I've, I've one of my most reread books ever. And I just really love, I like love food writing and I miss, and now understandably there's like, wait, it, there has to be ways to make it, you know, financially viable. Um, but I do have like a nostalgia for, for that sort of original time of it um mm-hmm. or like blue plate special um uh uh linking on her name um but yeah there's a couple of food memoirs that i, I just really love uh, or molly's homemade life um, oh yeah wow you're really speaking my language here yeah that, that's <laughs> this was all these are all my friends that like all had like books come out around the same time and i think i think what i think what got tricky for all of us was like you know when it was just this quiet little thing we were doing with like a cute little audience it was, it felt very charming and like, you know, authentic. And then sort of you get, when you get the rewards and like, you know, people are like, Ooh, we're gonna, we'll publish your cookbook. We'll put you on the yeah. food network. It's like, Oh, then it starts to become more, you know, crass, I suppose. Yep. And now I'm like, and now I like sort of like, you know, I follow a lot of these people now on Instagram and, you know, I do like the reels. I do like the new, th- you know, there are things that I'm like, okay, I can like get into these new formats. Um, 
but I do like the meandering life to recipe. Yeah. Essay. Yeah. Well, it so. makes me think of your work too. Cause I mean, random acts of flyness, which is on HBO, which you produce, like it sort of feels like there's a looseness, a playfulness, like it's not yeah. ag agenda driven necessarily. It's sort of just like, there's something, yeah. there's something there, but it's like yeah. it's more about the, the journey rather than the destination. Yeah, it's funny. Something actually Tess and I have been talking a lot about is just like, we both have a big fondness for like exploratory shows that feel like there are ways, to, like shows that feel a bit more wandering or exploratory versus um, straight nose plot driven who done it. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love both. Like I, I will watch, you know, Mayor of East Town as much as I'll watch, you know, something else. But um, I do like, uh, yeah, I do like art or I do like storytelling that feels um, surprising in yeah. terms of that structure. Yeah. Well, it's like Fleabag or um, what's Michaela Cole's show? And I'm blinking. Uh, I May Destroy You. I May Destroy It. Yeah, it's a fantastic. Per, like, a perfect season of television. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's yeah. sort of surprising in the, in the directions that it goes because you think you know what it's about, but then it's like, oh, wait, maybe it's not about that or it is yeah. about that. You know, um, yeah. well, that's fascinating. So, about, but I have to go back to your cooking now. So when you do these dinners, so one of the things that I was going to bring up though about you, I'm curious about is just the idea of perfectionism and mm -hmm. how you, because it seems even like as we've been talking and you were like researching the cookbook name and wanting to get it right and stuff like, is, <laughs> is, is perfectionism something you struggle with or is it something that you're able to deal with pretty well? Um, great question. I, I don't think I'm a perfectionist and maybe because my standard of perfectionism is very, very high. Um, I think I'm pretty okay. I, I, I would like, I'm, I would say I'm a very ambitious person, but not competitive person. Like I'm not someone who's like, um, like I don't need to be the best at everything. I also mm -hmm. obviously am not, but like, uh, I do think when I, I think if it's something I really care about though, I do have a standard I am concerned about reaching. Um, mm -hmm. but I also think not reaching it is part of the fun of it. Like I, th I do sort of, I get, I feel like I spiral into certain zones. It could be cooking, it could be filmmaking, it could be like mm -hmm. certain things. Um, but I don't know if I, I don't think I would call myself a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe others would, but I don't think I would. Well, maybe it's more about like knowing because the way you talked about it, it sounds like it's about knowing what the best version of something might be or like knowing what you're shooting for like knowing like yeah. have, having good taste and like just sort of trying to achieve the best version in your mind of what that could be but then be accepting that that might not happen that's true I will say if I'm cooking for company I do obsessively read the reviews of a recipe for example or the comment section of a recipe mm -hmm. to make sure uh I don't fall like that like I, it's uh, I will say I tend to be risk averse if I'm, if it's me cooking for a bunch of people or even a few people, I tend to make sure it's like a very tested recipe or from a food writer like yourself or Deb mm -hmm. or someone like that, who I know is very good at testing recipes um, to feel, to make sure I don't like, I, yes, I feel like I would struggle with misfiring a dish in front of other people. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. What, how, <laughs> how do you I deal? I'd be as relaxed about that as I'd like to think. I'd be like, sad about it have you had any culinary disasters that come to oh mind? for sure um I mean I once like made a cake and then just dropped it <laughs> really you dropped the whole cake I dropped it was like literally like this fast cheesecake and I like literally <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I took it out of the oven and it was like this beautiful thing I was so proud I'd like obsessed I, it was actually a recipe from a cozy kitchen uh -huh. her, and I like I was like so obsessively getting her I was like dming her she doesn't know me but I was, like, she, was, like <laughs> she very like graciously was like answering my like I'm like can this cheese like this brand of blah 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 and then after all this work it comes out perfectly and then I literally uh drop it and it it, it was it was like totally destroyed. in front of other people or just like by yourself in the kitchen uh it people weren't there yet but so it was <sighs> and were you like in tears on the floor like picking up like <laughs> Things. I was so, I was like kind of in shock. <laughs> why, I, I have to get into the details of this though. So like, why do you, how do you, how do you think you dropped it? Like, do you think you tripped over something or like? Um, I. Uh... <laughs> because, you know, Freud, Freud would say that you didn't accidentally drop it. That's true. Um, you wanted to drop it. I, uh, I'm trying to describe this without sort of doing a tedious layout of my kitchen, but 
I was just walking from the oven to my kitchen table, which is not a very long way. I was also trying to put it on a, a, a cake stand. Oh, it needed to cool, like it was like a cheesecake. And um, God, I feel like I've blocked this out from my memory. Um, this is good, this is good therapy. Yeah, keep going. And <laughs> I was about to, and then I, it was a, it was a very, I had not, I did not put the overhead light on in my kitchen. I had just put on like a lamp. So there was like the light was a little low, which is on me. And I just literally like, instead of it landing on the cake platter, I just, it just like fell out. It just like did not land on the table. <laughs> and I think I was in such, I literally just, it just like was like the smash destroying cake on the floor. I like. I was on the floor. Okay. So it was like landed on the floor. I mean, it was like a total like cartoonish, like literally a cartoon painting of a, of a ruined cake. And it hadn't floor. set yet. So it was just like globs of cream cheese. And, yeah. <laughs> it had yeah. not set yet. It was completely unsalvageable. Um, and I just actually just like walked away. And oh. I just I didn't even like immediately pick it up. I just like walked away. <laughs> I was, like, so I was in such shock. And I think I just like immediately just like texted like, you know, my supper club friends, like my just like people like my sister, like people who like know me close and just like this. And they were all everyone was so sad for me. Um, that I kind of that which helped me get over it I feel like everyone else was like so emotional for me about this like they couldn't like ever my sister like couldn't get over what it happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah and, wow uh, that's a good story though yeah I haven't it's, I've forgotten about that one yeah you're bringing up the yeah the, this is the, trauma the, yeah this is what I do <laughs> this is my job but so have you ever attempted a Basque cheesecake since or was that the only no, time I actually and it's funny um it's so funny you say this because a cozy uh she had she reposted recently on her greater in stories like uh like recipes from her archive and one of them was that and I, I literally remember seeing this cake on her feed like again and, and it like brought me back and I'm like, oh, I can't ever and it, it was a great recipe and, and she, she was so nice to like dm me like she was it was such a, like I was feeling like oh I'm doing everything right and then and then I just dropped it <laughs> <laughs> so um so when you have a disaster like that like does it like really traumatize you like like did it take a while for you to get back in the kitchen or are you able to shake it off uh I can definitely get back in the kitchen I think it like I feel like baking mishaps throw me off much more than cooking mishaps mm -hmm. baking I tolerate cooking I love baking um there's something about the mess from baking that I always slightly resent. There's something about even just the act of like flour getting, like there's something about literally cleaning from baking that I, like I don't, I don't have a dishwasher so I hand wash and like there's something about cleaning by hand like batter or even like cleaning measuring spoons. Something mm -hmm. about like actually cleaning up from baking that I just don't enjoy versus like I can scrub a pot all day. Like, like something about other cleaning doesn't bother me. So whenever I actually invest in the time to bake, because I feel like I sort of don't do it if unless I really want to, and it doesn't go well. Like cleaning the dishes from that broken cake really was sad. It, was it sad. broke you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, that felt, a lot, there was a lot of resentment there, yeah. Well, it's funny because they do say that there's like baking kind of cooks and then, uh, yeah. or bakers and then like savory cooks because bakers are very precise and like want to know it's like one precise tablespoon of baking powder or whatever. But I've never yeah. heard two personalities described as like who, like what kind of dishes you prefer doing. Like, do you prefer yeah, doing baking dishes or, yeah, I get that. Like, flour is a, is a real pain to get out of. Flour something. is a little annoying. And, um, I would, I also like to improvise a bit. Like, I'm not a huge, like, I like to feel, like I like I like I know how to adjust seasoning. I know how to you know yeah. a, a new ingredient into something if I have it. Like I like that sense of freedom, even if it's something super tiny. And I just feel with baking, I'm sort of really beholden to being precise, which um, also adds to my resentment about baking. But like, but yeah. Well, it's interesting because like, I feel like all of this is an insight into your character, which is a sort of like, there's a looseness and a playfulness, but also like a precision and a you know, <laughs> desire for success. So it's like, it's really cool to think about the work that you do and then how you cook and like how it all kind of adds up to a interesting whole. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, this is, I'm learning, I'm learning a lot hearing myself say this. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned like when you do, you do dinner parties, if you're cooking for guests, mm -hmm. uh, what, 
I wanted to ask like, what is a typical meal that you would cook for, for guests? Um, for guests, I feel like a foolproof thing for a guest for me is like any sort of braise, anything mm. that's like, can be in the, if it's not hot, if it's not summer, like for me, an ideal cooking for guests that makes me feel not like I'm uh, working too hard. And like, I, I've made many mistakes where I've done the most and done the fanciest stuff and then been too exhausted to actually. Yeah. And now I'm very much of the age of like, uh, refuse to do that. Like, I only want to do a project if I'm doing it with other people. Like, I, I, I'm sort of very much over cooking to impress and just right. and I very much it's like no the whole point of this is to have fun and actually sit down with people um so for me I feel like a very go-to formula is like any sort of braise because you can just leave same it here the by the way I love braising so. I I do know I I feel like actually the way you do a dinner party is very similar like I love it I love if I I, I do love a cake because I um versus like a fussier individual dessert because that can stress me out so I'm just mm -hmm. like I, I, like I can do a good cake like an, like I feel like I've seen your dinner parties I'm like yeah this is what I make it's like a salad with a more like acidic dressing and then like a braise that's sort of mm -hmm. more heavier and then like an apple cake or something and like right, totally and that's like it that for me feels like go to feel confident in it and then appetizers I like don't do fussy appetizers I will like have people bring stuff or I will just put something out very simple mm -hmm. um and then um maybe a fun cocktail or whatever but like I feel like something that the oven is doing most of the work uh is always um it also makes it it's, it's also something I uh like I don't braise for like one to two people you know like that feels like there's something festive to me about yeah. um that or just something that takes oven work I feel like I really try to avoid for a dinner party things that have to be served immediately. That's generally mm -hmm. um, something I try because I don't want to ever be that host that's like, uh, guys, can you stop talking? Because you have to <laughs> the, the scallion uh, yeah. is ready right now or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I sometimes have to do that. Well, I, I've kind of shifted gears a little bit because I used to just only do like braises or make ahead like casseroles and things. But then like more recently, I'm like working on this cookbook. So like I had friends come over and I needed to test fried chicken. And I was like, I was going to do it all ahead and keep it warm in the oven. But I was like, you know, what? it's going to taste better out of like the frying pan. So I just was like, I'm just going to fry it while they're all here. So I think as I've gotten more confident, I've gotten actually, I've kind of been like able to circle back to like cooking a la minute, as they say, like to the minute, you know, so it's not make ahead. That's good. I, I actually want to, I feel like maybe I'm in a, I feel like I should be changing up my formula a little no, bit no you should just do you be you <laughs> <laughs> um I also and this I definitely pick up from my mom and I always feel like my mom did this and it was always felt like the ultimate sense of like care and I always feel like I do this in dinner parties when I can which is like just plate the just give plate plate it for them and then like right. they're already sitting and just like and then almost like as if they don't even realize it's coming and like here's your food like and I remember there was always I remember my mom would do that uh, for me and my sister. It would just be like, I feel like the most loving thing ever when you're just like not even expecting something. And then there's like this plate of dessert with the ice cream and like everything is just like plated in the floor. Oh, that's it's, nice. It's just, there's something so like loving towards that that I definitely, my mom would do or she does for guests. Um, and, uh, you know, I try to do that. I'm also trying to be better about like, accepting help for cleaning dishes for my friends mm -hmm. who are always very good about that um and well, it's funny to... because like that <clears throat> living in LA right it's as you talked about your mom like making the plate like I've learned to actually just put things out family style because otherwise people are like oh my god this portion is enormous I can't eat all this <laughs> and it's like you know what serve yourself help yourself <laughs> um yeah so yeah you also I mean family style is also ideal I have a I do have a table people can sit around but it's 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 at mo it comfortably it fits four to five so okay. I have more than that I people sit in my living room um but yeah yeah this what is, part of New York are you in I'm in Brooklyn I'm in Flatbush I'm by Prospect Park yeah. oh nice okay I used to live in uh Park Slope so not too far yes I remember uh, I used to be a New York New Yorker yeah I'm coming back next week to visit Craig so maybe I'll see you yeah we're not quite done yet one thing I was curious about um was about ego and egolessness because um 
it feels like being a producer, it's like you're not in the limelight. It's not about you. It's about getting the project done. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that aspect of being a producer that is also making me think of your cooking, where it's like the way you describe like having friends come over and all cook together. So it's like not about you. Because for me, I I guess I have a big enough ego that I want to be the shining star and be like, <laughs> look what I've done for you all. Can you believe it? Like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to take bows. But like, but that's like my own narcissism. And obviously I have my Instagram and my blog, you know, it's like, I'm putting it all, it's all about me in a weird way, but I feel like what you're doing is more just for the sake of doing it and for the pleasure of doing it. Well, I would say you professionally have engaged with food, like in a way that I have not. So like there's an identity element for you that is less, the stakes are lower for me, I will say, um, mm -hmm. than it is for you. I, I'd like to think I'm pretty ego free. I, um, I would say when I was like, I will like, I sort of cringe when I think about like <laughs> how I would cook for friends in like my early twenties. I think I was very much like, did I do it right? Did I like, did I like, I was sort of very caught up in like, did they like it? Am I like, I would need, I would get, um, or is it fancy enough or is it whatever? Right. And I do think like blissfully. So, uh, I, I like, I'm sort of just like, I know what I, I know. I, I, I know, when some, I know if it tastes good. I feel like I, it's been a long time when I'm like nervous about my cooking. It's, it's just not something I'm nervous about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just sort of feel like when I, and I've also like, I've been a guest many times at situations where you can tell someone's trying to be a bit show offy mm -hmm. and you just sort of feel like you're like, in a fishbowl being observed and I'm like I don't ever want to be that person so right like a formal like, dinner party or it's like very formal, yeah and like love a formal dinner party but you know the point of it is the gathering like I feel like that's mm -hmm. like my wisdom and as I like is my in my 30s is like the food should feel secondary a little bit in terms of like the the energy that feels really good in that moment mm -hmm. is the food is amplifying it it's not you know but um, I don't know, uh, thinking tied to my work, producers, I'm generally a camera shy, like don't need to be center of attention mm -hmm. person. I've never, um, I've never had that craving, but I've, I'm definitely very, uh, I'm definitely very ambitious and can be very competitive with myself and care about credit and care about like, you know, mm. something really having seen the light of day. And um, I'm definitely not beyond the ego <laughs> to be clear yeah <laughs> it was funny because like I once had I had another podcast years ago called the clean plate club okay. and um and I would have like a dinner party and I, it was actually the, like the most poorly produced podcast of all time because <laughs> I had a microphone in the middle of the table and then four people around the table and we were all talking and all you heard was like knives and forks like scraping on dishes <laughs> So I it was, you tried something new. That's cool. Yeah, but I had um, a chef on Suzanne Tract, who's the chef at Jar in LA. She's an amazing chef, and talk about egoless. Like she's not a you know she doesn't stand in the limelight, but she's just a hardworking chef. But I had her over, and the, and I made a meal, and I remember being so nervous. Like, what did she think? And I think I was kind of bugging her. Like, so what do you think is a chicken okay? I made like spatchcock chicken, one of my go-to things, and I think her reaction was just like, yeah, it's great. Like it's very good. It was a good job. Like like I think it for her it was sort of like. It, it was almost absurd to her that I was like being so needy. <laughs> like it was just like for her, it was just like the gesture of like, you know, you made food and we're eating it. And it's not about that. <laughs> yeah. I think I've also, the older I get, the more I'm like, oh, it's such a gift to be cooked for. Like what yes. a nice thing. Like I, I do look, I love your Insta story thing because it, you, you cook and I feel like you think of menus in a way that feels very simpatico with like how I think. And like I, I your, your Insta story has got me through the pandemic. Oh my gosh. Thank you was like I just I really love watching how you put together a menu and there is just something that's like so lovely about being a guest to that and I think as I've been and I think also as I've gotten older I have a lot more friendships where they are very people are just so generous and I've been on the receiving end of that and it's just it's just when I do it for others I'm like yeah this is a nice <laughs> yeah. this is a very like lovely experience to have and to, to, to get and to give and um you sh yeah it's well it's that's that's helpful to remember that yeah because I think sometimes I get so stressed out 
if like I'm cooking for somebody that I'm nervous to cook for. And then I'm like, oh, wait a second. This is like a nice thing that I'm doing. Like what you're, what you're I've saying. Also, yeah. I've also never cooked for a professional chef in that way. So I'm sure I'd be very nervous. Yeah. But she was really cool about it. Um, what was I just going to ask? Oh, I was going to ask you before we get to the end um, uh, about working on the Eater show. Like, how was that? Oh, sure. Yeah, it was funny. I was, it was a great experience. It was, um, it was, <laughs> I was working on it right up until the pandemic, like literally okay. it was on a flight to Budapest for a Budapest episode on like March 17th, 20, wow. like, it was like right when that was happening. Um, and it was very fun. It was sort of, it's, I don't normally do unscripted work. I don't normally do, um, food television. So it was an unusual, um, Thing to say yes to but I, I said yes to it partly because I wanted a different I wanted to see what that was like and it's it's a, a very fun space in like the world in this in the world of television at large it's a very fun um space of 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 filmmaking and um and you were on uh, location like, did you go to all the places and eat all the food of the episodes I was on, um, there was, uh, yes, I was in the field for the, for the episodes I was doing and it was, you know, a lot of travel and you're in and out and the, the, the crew were just really professionals, like to have done a lot of different food shows before. Um, but I really, it was really fun. We had a, I had a really lovely showrunner and, uh, on that and, uh, to made two friends who are now very, very close friends of mine from that show that I, uh, I've become like very big additions in my life in general. And, um, but it was, you know, it was really interesting to like, you know, how do you shoot on the fly in a, in a restaurant kitchen? And like, like, how do you, how do you be invisible, but also get the glamorous shot? And, and, you know, they're running a restaurant and they're trying to get to their customers and you have to be, and the food is cooling and you're like, nope, need the beauty shot, need this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was very fun. And it, I got to see quite a diversity, you know, we, I we were filming in uh like with Jean George and like very sort of high-end folks and also um like hole in the wall barbecue spot so it was like really got to see um you know restaurant kitchen uh labor and organization in in sort of very different ends and um that was very fun wait which yeah. places did you go where where were you so I did the LA episode um and actually Tejal Rao yeah, yeah of course she, uh, I remember her uh, food, I also love her as a food writer. I remember her, her um, Instagram actually DM'd with her because there was a couple of spots that I like discovered when I was researching what shows, which places to, to film. She was a um, very useful resource for me. Uh, did LA, then did a, then did an episode that was incredibly, um, <laughs> uh did not match the time it was sort of like it's kind of crazy it was like all about food to get near airports <laughs> um that is like literally like when the pandemic happened they're like i can't think of a more irrelevant <laughs> <laughs> that's really episode. funny yeah but that was, it was a fun one because it was everywhere from like miami to dc to atlanta it made me learn a lot about um the atlanta food scene which i had no i, I had no um i had never sort of thought of honestly and had, had no in, um knowledge of and mm -hmm. that was that was actually an interesting space to, so you went to all those places to the airport all places i very sadly was really excited to do the budapest episode obviously um yeah. and so it was very sad when that had to get canceled the show was originally supposed to be 10 episodes um uh but we got seven out which is a big it's surprise. on pbs it's on hulu on hulu okay great yeah. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Well, um, we are almost at the end. So I don't know if you've listened to this before, but every podcast begins with what did you have for lunch? But it ends with what are you having for dinner tonight? Oh, wow. Um, I'm actually going up to my old stomping grounds by Columbia University to see some friends. Um, uh, and so I will probably be eating something near nostalgic, college nostalgic by campus. I don't know what yet, but probably something not great for me but up there yeah <laughs> what are some of your favorite uh places to go in your Columbia? Um, actually a lot of that area has changed so much but there is a like kati roll like a roadie roll mm. um type spot that is always i remember being like college like drunk food satisfying when you were that age um 
So probably something like that near there. <laughs> it's so funny. I, I applied early decision for college to Columbia. And uh-huh. around the same time, the movie The Mirror Has Two Faces starring Barbara Streisand came out where she plays <laughs> a Columbia professor who teaches a class on sex and romance. <laughs> She's sort of like an ugly duckling. And then she meets like Jeff Bridges and like becomes like a swan. But anyway, like it made Columbia. I've never Columbia- seen it, which is crazy. Oh, you have to watch it. I mean, because it makes Columbia look like the most beautiful school in the world. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like this is where clearly where I'm going to go because it's like Barbara Streisand is a teacher there and it's a beautiful school. And I got rejected. I didn't get in so it never happened so Columbia is always that like it might what my life might have been so different if I'd gone there <laughs> you went to NYU no. uh, I went to Emory undergrad and then I went to NYU NYU for grad school for gotcha. dramatic writing and I okay. also went to uh Emory law school but that's a whole other story for another time <laughs> um, I, think, I think it yeah it, without sounding like I've stalked you for so long I think I did know you went to law school um that's fine I like being stalked but wait so did you, you went to Columbia for undergrad Went to Columbia for undergrad, um, majored in film studies, um, and then, yeah, and then did not do grad school because it was too much money. But yeah, uh, it's a lot of money. Was, was the right choice. So did you wait, did you study film in at Columbia like with an interest at first in doing like features and like doing like indie film and stuff like that or was yeah it- I um so it, uh there's no like sub focus at Columbia at the, in in undergrad it's like film studies it's almost like an English lit major but it's like you're you're studying films instead mm-hmm. of te- text but um I you know went into college thinking I would wanted to be a director um because I didn't really know what, what a producer was and sort of uh by a process of elimination realized that I wanted to produce. I've always, I sort of always view myself as a film, a film over TV person. Um, I still very much like Tess and I are making um, movies on our slate and I just sort of am a cinephile leaning person. And I, I have a kind of old man rant about movie theaters and the format of like, I think the 90 minute two hour f- storytelling format is, is really good and I think mm-hmm. it's never gonna die. I love TV, but I think my heart is always um, in movies. And, and so yes, I did definitely start in the micro budget feature world. I probably know many people that your husband knows. Yeah, um, sure. Started in the very, very tiny budget uh, indie feature world. Yeah, before moving more into TV. Yeah. Well, the, the obvious final question for our interview will be, um, what are your favorite food movies? Whew. Oh, great. <laughs> just gotta put you on the spot but I mean you know oh, since- um actually I'm gonna say uh is it uh Tampopo the- yeah Tampopo I yeah, just watched that I, yeah uh I watched it for the first time over pan- over the pandemic and I just I, it was like one of my favorite pandemic watches me and, too yeah uh, I loved it yeah I think it's just so it, it for me it, it treated food in the perfect way I would want film Move, film food to be treated which is like both irreverently and also very seriously and mm-hmm. also like it's part of the plot but it's also really not the plot and um yeah that would definitely be the hard to be answer for me yeah. well yeah I mean because it, it had always been on my list of like we have to watch Tampopo but it always had felt like a little bit like homework like okay here I have sure. to watch this like movie about ramen I mean I like ramen but I was like it seems like it's gonna be boring but it was anything but boring and yeah. like anything but serious I mean I mean it was serious but it was so funny and so outrageous so funny. And shocking in parts too so so funny yeah. yeah um yeah I do have one food stylist credit on an indie film from like years ago and I had to make I was like a producer on the project but we didn't have enough money for an actual food stylist so I had to do it and uh food styling a movie that's it's uh it's it's a it's I'm sure you know this already but it's it's a whole other what was the movie um it was called this very tiny indie called man with van um that we shot in New York and there was this egg benedict scene and I had to learn how to make poached eggs at, that's like, so hard yeah I learned a lot of techniques on making like mass poached eggs with, but like could do the sort of yolk spill <laughs> at the exact moment and the technique I that actually was very useful was to crack the egg into a saran wrap and then tie it into a bag and then drop that into the boiling water. So really? It changed its shape easily. So then you just unwrap the saran wrap. I don't know. This is not a, prof- I'm not a professional food. No, star. that sounds very smart. I've never been able to poach eggs well. And I've tried every technique from like making a whirlpool to like yep. pouring it in from a little ramekin, but it's never. I feel like the ra- I feel like the vinegar thing is not real. Like, no. I feel like I, I remember as someone who had to practice, this is like 10 years ago. 
but I, uh, as someone who had to practice making poached eggs a lot before that shoot day, none of the, the whirlpool, like none of those worked for me as like a consistent yeah. shoot. Wow. Egg, the saran wrap, it worked actually. I yeah. once watched like, maybe it was the documentary about Jeremiah Tower that Anthony Bourdain produced, but they, they were showing Tavern on the Green's brunch and how there's like this vat of poached eggs that's just like sitting there and like a yeah. vat of like hollandaise. It's like, oh, like I don't <laughs> want to order that at a restaurant. All right, well, Kishore, you've been a great sport. Thank you so much for doing Thank lunch you. therapy. Yeah, this will be up tomorrow. So I'll get oh, ready wow. for all the fanfare and um, well, good luck with everything. And maybe I'll see you when I'm in New York. Yes, absolutely. You should reach out. All right. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.